You're listening to a DM podcast. This time of the year at the moment, we've you know we've got a 38 and a 40 degrees to today, tomorrow, and Sunday. Even though your air temperature might be cooler at night, in the summers we don't go back out at night because the ground's that hot, and if there's no breeze, it just seeps out of the ground and it. You know, it might be 28 up on the surface, but you get down onto your floor, it's still 45 degrees. Still breathing okay at the moment. Is it a big property? That blood pressure is not coming up. Hi, my name is Lana Mitchell from the Royal Flying Doctor Service. This is a podcast about life in the bush, mateship, courage and the role that the Royal Flying Doctor Service plays in serving rural and remote communities. This is the Flying Doctor Podcast. My name is Kira Lee Dargan from the Royal Flying Doctor Service and I'm an Aboriginal woman of the Radri Nation. This podcast has been recorded on Ngunnawal land and is being broadcast across all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander nations. We at the Royal Flying Doctor Service want to acknowledge Elders, past and present, the RFDS recognises that this is First People's land and always will be. Andamooka is situated approximately five to six hours north of Adelaide and a full 12 hour drive from Alice Springs. In summer, the place can be one of the hottest on earth, but it also has a wealth of desert wildlife with almost 200 bird species and 45 different reptiles in the region. Andamooka lies on Kunyani traditional land but it's also one of the later opal fields found in Australia. The story goes that back in 1930, two blokes had climbed a hill to watch their horses drink and to fill time had been throwing rocks in a challenge to see who could throw the furthest. One of the rocks they picked up was covered in opal. Though they kept the opal finds a secret for some two years, eventually word leaked there were riches to be found and soon miners arrived from Kupapiti to look for opal too. Today, Andamooka Crystal Opal is a luxury brand and is renowned as being the finest quality opal in the world. Andamooka Opal is the most stable of Australian opals in that it does not fade, praise or crack. And it's deemed to be ethical to mine opal there in Andamooka since an Indigenous land use agreement has been signed. Interestingly, Andamooka is also famous for fossilised and opalised dinosaurs as Andamooka is on the edge of the ancient Eramanga Sea. During the Cretaceous period, the vast ocean's gradual retreat saw large-scale opalization of a wide array of prehistoric marine life, including giant reptiles and other creatures swimming and roaming the shoreline in shallow seawater. In fact, South Australia's only known dinosaur was discovered in Andamooka. Now, Richard Hawkins has lived and worked in Andamooka for 35 years. He is passionate about the town, the remote landscape and the opals. Hello, Richard. How you going, Lana? I'm good. How did you come to be living in Andamooka? Um, always had a passion for exploring and, and doing something different. I grew up um, pretty well in a mixture of um, a little town on the west coast called Thevenard, just outside of Sojourner, pretty well from just after birth till I was 15. Uh, during those times, I did a lot of school of the air. I was working with my father on the on the Nullarbor um, in the summers. He was a shark fisherman at Mundrabilla, uh, just over in the into WA past Eucla. Um And in the winters, he was a fox shooter up north of Cook, up up on the Transcontinental Railway line. So, I spent both of those seasons with my dad. Other than the summer one, in the shark fishing, there was not a lot of school on during then because it's so, you know, Australia's summer school holidays. But the winter one, did a lot of school of the air, grew up in the desert, uh, went to Adelaide to finish my SSC, a couple of years there, and uh, I did two apprenticeships in Adelaide. First one was electronics technician, which is, you know, with today's throwaway society, it's, it was a waste of four years of my life pretty well. Uh, then a, a diesel mechanic, diesel fitting course. So I finished that apprenticeship and a week later I was in the car with a friend of mine and we off to Kiba Pedy with our picks and shovels and screens and we were going to make it big on the Opal. Spent three months in Kiba Pedy. Did it happen? Did you make it big in Cooper Pedy? No, we, no, we found a little bit of Opal, but I, I didn't like the people. The pe- people were very secretive. 
they didn't like new people coming onto the field and, and digging the ground that they might dig in 200 years' time. You know, they'll never get to it all, but they were just a very clicky bunch. So we sort of, we found a little bit of opal, not enough to, you know, make a fortune on, obviously, but on the way back from Cooper PD to Adelaide, we um, stopped over at uh, Spud's Roadhouse at Pimba. So we're sitting in there and then, you know, having dinner and, bed down for the night in one of the dongas out the back, one of the camp rooms. And um, a couple of the blokes from Andamooka turned up and we just got chatting, you know. They were friendly. They were very friendly. And, um, yeah, long story short, I think after probably about 30 beers each and shooters and everything else, I woke up in Andamooka the next morning. I had no idea how I got here. Um, (laughs) And you've never left. No, never (laughs) left. You've been there ever since. Been there ever since. Oh, that's a classic story, Richard. I got drunk at the pub and woke up in Andamooka the next day and I've been there ever since. That's exactly how it happened, (laughs) Lana. That's exactly how it happened. And I I went on, you know, to have partnerships with all three of them blokes and, you know, they were very old open miners. They were the last of the old school. All of those guys have since passed um, and I actually feel honoured that I... Um, I had the chance to work with them in the you know the latter part of their life when they needed some young blood to to do the hard yards, but those guys had the brains. They they taught me what to look for, how to find it. Quite frankly, it has made me quite a successful miner having having had that experience. So, so it's like you had an apprenticeship, really, from from pretty the old pretty much guard. from three of the best. How how old were you then when you arrived in Andamooka? Uh, I would have been twenty four years old. What does a day for you look like in terms of a work day? Um, because the climate there is so harsh. It is. Well, f- for me, it's pretty well up at 5.30 most mornings. Uh, at the moment now, I've got to uh, make myself my, my, my drinks, um, food and lunch. I tend to take that all with me. Some of the places that we mine are quite a far way out from, from town. Um, so, yeah, you don't want to be running back because you just, you just lose too much time on the ground. Um, head out to the claim, quarter to seven, start the machines up, uh, go down to the face, have a look and see if anything's exposed itself overnight or anyone else has gone in there to dig out what you were digging out the night before. Yeah, 15 minutes to warm the machines up and then, yeah, cut a fresh face and then turn that off and then uh, onto the face with a jackhammer. And you're pretty well jackhammering for an hour, go in through the opal level, you know, as deep as you can get start the machine up, cleave off all the overburden and clean the floor. So we try and make it nice and comfortable so we can stand, you know, shoulder height at the level, sort of like a lot more comfortable for digging. Um, and basically it's a, yeah, it's a race against the heat. As soon as the, as soon as the heat comes, pack her all up, go home, quick shower, and then uh, down here to the office of the Progress Association and, you know, work on my projects. I work down here as a... Um, um, uh, maintenance and projects manager, mm. stuff I've learned in you know in a previous life, but um, yeah, I enjoy it. So back then, Richard, um, when you uh, would be out there working, I mean, there's no shade. So um, does that mean that you work from seven till eleven or twelve, or do you then go back later in the afternoon? It depends. This this time of the year, at the moment, we've you know we've got a thirty-eight and a forty degrees today, tomorrow and Sunday, uh, those are pretty well you work up to about 11, maybe 12, and then you knock off, you finish for the day. Uh, by the time the, the ground gets hot, even though your air temperature might be cooler at night, in the summers, not we don't go back out at night because the ground's that hot and if there's no breeze, it just seeps out of the ground and it, you know, it might be 28 up on the surface, but you get down onto your floor, it's still 45 degrees. So we give it a miss. In the yeah. in the winter, winter's a different story. Obviously, spring and, and autumn, you get a mix of the two. Um, but but winter's good. Winter's, you get out there some mornings and it's, you know, it's close to zero or, or below zero. Sometimes you you can't get the machine started. And when you get these big cold spells coming through, you've got to actually park the machines up the back of them, the motor, towards the sun and give them an hour of sunlight before you can actually start them because it's that cold. Wow. 
So it really is the extremes, isn't it? It's such desert yeah. climate, such extreme. Now, I have to ask, Richard, have you made your fortune finding opals? Is it something where you find opals on a regular basis or how, how has your success been over 35 years of mining opals? Would you consider yourself a, um, an expert? No, I wouldn't consider myself an expert. No one's an expert at opal mining. As all opal miners in Andamuka tell you, there is no opal in Andamuka. We don't find anything. Um, (laughs) (laughs) is that is that so that's the so basically nobody finds anything but then everybody still has enough money to live so some it's just a very quiet surreptitious career is that the deal it it, it is it is it's um um yeah i I hope the tax man doesn't listen to this podcast but it's it's a it's, it's a funny thing it's it's one of them things you'll find it um it's a cash industry um you get you get paid in shoe boxes of $100 notes. That's just how it works. Um, if you want to spend the money um, on something legitimate, yeah. then, yes, you have to declare a certain amount of income to warrant that spend. Um, but basically, all the opal miners in Andamuka, they've just got shoe boxes of cash laying around. Until they need something, they won't declare it. <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh! I'm sure it's not alone in that in that in that way. I'm sure there's townships, mining townships all over the country that have a yeah. similar sort of operating basis. Yeah. So, well, tell me about the landscape. Could you describe the landscape of Andamuka? What does it look like, and as a township and as a landscape? Um, Andamuka itself um, is is quite pretty. The landscape around here is featureless. It's it's very slight rolling hills. You wouldn't, you, we wouldn't have a hill over 50 metres high. And, you know, that might be 10 kilometres across. It's, um, yeah, quite featureless. But where the, the riverbed um, in Andamuka that followed the main fault that created the Opal, um, it's the main street, it's called the Opal Creek Boulevard, and there's quite steep um, hills and all the homes are built into the hillsides overlooking the creek, basically. So it is quite picturesque and it's nice down in the creek. There's quite a few trees and, and um, uh, yeah, it's, it's a lot cooler down here in the summer. Um, up on the top, it's hotter, it's um, flatter. Yeah, it's pretty featureless. It's the only place you'll find a tree is along a creek line, which, by the way, is the open mining faults because the, when the ground shifted, the water flowed along and created the creek. So that's one of the methods I got taught for finding opal mining is um, look at your creeks and your trees. They'll, they'll tell you where it is. Yeah, so after a lot of rain, um, a lot of prickle bushes, they can be troublesome, but uh, basically it's a gibber, flat stone coated plain, pretty much. That It gets bakingly hot in the summer sun, believe me. It's, yeah, you, you might have a, you know, it might be a 50 degree day, but you pick up a rock off the ground, it'll, it'll melt into your hand, it'll burn into your hand. What do you love about that sort of landscape? I mean, it's so different from what most of us would consider, you know, or what we look at as we, you know, live somewhere on the east coast or west coast or coastline of Australia. So is it the landscape that you love or is it the opals that keep you there? It's 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 a combination of both, Anna. It's, um, I've often wondered in summer what is it I like about the place, but when you when you drive out across the plains in the morning as the sun's just about to rise and and it, it's I think the fact that it's featureless it allows you to, just to reflect on on other things in life because your eyes and your mind aren't busy looking at things you know you, you actually have time to process some inner thoughts and it's the silence the serenity of it all it, it's yeah there's no rush there's no hustle and bustle there's you know there's nothing to distract you from from your task at hand, which is, you know, obviously spend as much time as you can in, in the ground to yeah, make it, make your living and, and hopefully be the, the first person for 65 million years to lay eyes on something that's been hiding there for a long, long time. Well, an interesting fact is, um, which they don't tell you in the books, is that about, around 95% of all opal was a living creature at one time. It's actually huge. There's only 5% of opal that occurs that hasn't gone into a fossil of some sort. So when you first pull it out of the ground and you get to see it, it's 
you know, it's the, the challenge between, you know, yourself and your mining partner or partners is, you know, let's guess what this is. <laughs> play, play paleontology. Wow. Yeah. That's fantastic. Yeah. Now, a couple of years ago, you were, uh, you were out uh, in the field and you were in your heavy equipment um, and you weren't feeling well. Would you tell me what happened that morning? It was one of them summers that unusually I mined very late into the summer. I, I, I normally sort of shut it down, but at the time we wanted to finish this claim and get ready for winter for another project. Um, so we were pushing it pretty hard. We were working well over into the 40 degree temperatures and I think I was on about 10 days straight. One of the unfortunate things about living in the in the bush is everybody up here is heavy drinkers. Um, and if you want to be included in the town, you tend to join in with them. Um, so I think it was a combination of a lot of heat over a long period of time. Um, um, I'm certain alcohol played a part. But what happened was um, I was drinking huge amounts of water. I was always had to hop off the excavator to go to the toilet, and it was just all day. It was just constant, just drink, 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 because you think that's what you've got to do. But unbeknown. To me, I was actually flushing all my electrolytes out of my system. Yeah, so it, it's a fallacy to drink water. You need to get your moisture from other sources, milk, electrolyte replacements, juices or a combination of juice and water and never water alone for your sole source of liquids. Um, and mm -hmm. what I've done, it um, uh, reduced the ability for my nervous system to communicate my heart impulse pulses from my brain. So I started feeling a little bit off and I said to Ian, I, I just blinked out the window, I said, Ian, I'm not, not feeling real good and I, and I fainted. Apparently I'd fainted and fainted half hanging out the machine, out the excavator, he couldn't, couldn't raise me. Come back to, he said I was you know, out for a minute and I just had a really strange sensation. I just felt empty, I felt not like when you faint from seeing blood or... or those sorts of things or anything, you know, like, like that I've experienced fainting before. It was just, it just took a lot out of you. It just absolutely exhausted you instantly. Um, it happened again. Um, and then I was halfway out the excavator. Uh, this is over a period of about 15 minutes. So the boys didn't know whether to move me or not. They were panicking. Um, they they'd, um, got up onto the hill. They rang the RFDS. Um, then I got moved from there it was quite a tricky journey there was no room for stretches or anything like that alongside machine so it was i was basically skull dragged up the up the ramp to the surface level um, slid into the ambulance did a had another one there and then had a big one just outside of the raw flying doctor clinic they managed to rush me inside um, get me hooked up to an ecg pretty quickly they had the crash cart there just in case uh, i had the the fifth and the largest one then on the table. But um, fortunately, I was connected to the ECG when that happened. Um, and the data they got back from that was quite concise. I haven't had a heart attack, um, which was later followed up with blood tests to see if there was any markers from from heart attack. So I didn't have a heart attack. It was, it was then the nurse up there at the time pretty well diagnosed me instantly with um, dehydration and said, I've seen this before. So, so could I just clarify, Richard? So when you say these episodes of fainting, was your heart stopping or were you stopping breathing or were you just simply unconscious and then coming back? No, both. Just trying to understand. The heart stopped and it stopped while it was on the ECG, while I was on the monitor. So they had a record of that, which was which went a long way in my final diagnosis actually to to actually see what had happened. Um, so, yeah, heart stopped, wow. breathing stopped. Did they have to do CPR on you at any point in that from the excavator all the way through to the clinic or did you just sort of come back, did you sort of rally round again? And The heart was starting again by itself. Uh, the way it was explained to me was your, your, your brain sends the primary signal to control your heartbeat, your heart rate, et cetera, et cetera. When that stops, there's an uh, like an, an ancient genetic thing in the heart that actually kickstarts it back up again as a secondary until the primary re-establishes itself. 
So that would kick in. Wow. The, the primary would re-establish itself for a certain amount of time and then it would lose contact and turn off again. So it was, it was basically like flicking a light switch on and off, on and off, on and off with an emergency light coming on in the background. Wow. So the Andamuka, so you have um, an RFDS permanent clinic there yes. where there's nurses stationed. And so they got you in there and you said that the nurse um, said, oh, this is dehydration. Yep. What did they do? Did they immediately put you on fluids or what did they do? Yep, straight away, uh, two cannulas straight in. I had uh, saline solution, big bags of it either side of me. That was going in. They spoke to um, their doctor uh, on duty. Uh, he said good work, quick work. But basically, as soon as those electrolytes started going into me, it didn't reoccur. So, you know, as far as I'm concerned, they knew exactly what it was and, and, and moved very fast to um, start treatment. Uh, they stabilised me in um, there. Then they shuffled me across the Roxby Downs where I spent two nights and two days over there getting monitored and getting more electrolytes put into me. Were you driven or flown to Roxby? Uh, we were driven in the ambulance. Yeah, we, yep. we don't have an airport in Andamooka. So, yeah, unfortunately, the okay. RFDS can't land here, which is probably why we still got our clinic, thank God. You know, that, that clinic is a lifesaver mm. for... For not only for me, but for many people in this town. Is there no dirt strip just because there's too many slag heaps? <laughs> no. <laughs> Should I ask that? No. Is there just no space for it? Or no, because you've got plenty of heavy equipment, they could create one. Oh, we've got, a, we've got a beautiful dirt landing airstrip, probably the best one in Australia. <laughs> but um, we don't have a council as such in Andamooka. We're, um, we're, we're funded by donations us here at the Andamooka Progress Association, uh, we run the town like a council does and the money for that comes from what they call a community contribution scheme, whereas the town has decided that they will pay $400 per household per year to the Outback Communities Authority and then the Outback Communities Authority then match that dollar for dollar and give it back to us so that we can manage our town like a council. And it's it works out at around about our, our disposable income per year to run a town of 430 people and all its amenities is uh, 285000 per year. So we run an entire town on $285,000 a year. Um, it's hard work, Lana. It's, it's tough work, but... Out of that, we were we were told we had to maintain um, uh, an airstrip to CASA standards, and obviously that is out of the question. So our airport got shut right. down. Yeah. So okay, so they ferried you over to Roxby Downs. You've had uh, five episodes, as you were describing yep. them, where essentially you fainted, your heart stopped, and you're unconscious and then your body has rallied back up again and that happened twice in the heavy equipment uh, and, and then once in the ambulance and then once out the front of the clinic and then once in the clinic. Yep. So then they sh they ferry you off to Roxby. What did they say at Roxby? Uh, same thing. They, they did the um, same blood test that they done in Andamooka uh, because it's a, it's a private entity. So basically everything that happened to me up at the clinic, they did exactly the same. They did exactly the same and came mm. back with exactly the same diagnosis. You, you, you've got critically low electrolyte levels across the board. I've since found out it's coupled with a low white blood cell count, which is another battle I'm trying to get to the bottom of to find out why that's happening. Um, we think we know. But, yeah, it's, and the, the irony is is, is you, you, you have a massive lifestyle change straight after, but it only takes a couple of years to slip back into bad habits. And it's right. since happened to me again, Lana, and in, in very similar circumstances, actually. I mean, what are the lifestyle changes that you change? Just making sure that you are having high electrolyte intake or how do you manage to prevent that from occurring again? Um, it's, it's, it's knowing when you've had enough, when you've sweated enough and when it's hot enough, it's it's uh, it's hard because you'll be out there and you'll be on good material and you want to dig it out and you want to stay, but you've just got to you just got to say no. Look, this is this is 
this is what happens. We know what happens. Don't do it again. Go home, have a shower, relax, drink. The main lifestyle for me was uh, alcohol consumption. From, from growing up in the bush, you, you tend to be very big drinkers. And fingers crossed, I've had no other health concerns with that. But it changes you when, you, when this happens to you. It, it frightens the, the living hell out of you, actually. Um, so, yeah, so, so alcohol consumption and its reduction was a no-brainer for me. And, and after a scare like this, it's a hell of a lot easier than I thought it was ever going to be. Uh, there's uh, diet. Um, make sure you have your three to four meals per day, only small, high in grains, uh, high in fresh fruit, a lot of fresh vegetables, um, which living 600 kilometres north of a, a regional growing area can be quite difficult at times. But And expensive. Yes, it's ex- expensive, but, you know, it's it's something you have to do. So, you know, it's a, it's a lot of fruit, a lot of berries, a lot of fresh stuff, a lot of grains, all high electrolyte stuff. Add to that, I don't drink straight water anymore. I found out that milk is actually the electrolyte superhero out there. That's, and the irony is the only milk I would ever have in a day is is a dash in my cup of tea for breakfast, and that was all I had. I, I wouldn't eat in the morning. It was just a cup of tea, a cigarette, and, and off to work. So, you know, you're, you're three hours in on an empty stomach with no electrolytes, so you're sort of starting from behind the eight ball already. So, you, yeah. So, so now it's yeah, um, fresh strawberries and berries and big glasses of milk before I go out. Yeah, half juice, half water in trusty water bottle, two of them a day. You know, come home, have a... Normally when you pour in a glass of red wine, let's go to the freezer and get an electrolyte ice block and put the wine off for three or four hours. So a major lifestyle change for you then, major lifestyle change. Yeah, incredibly. So then a year and a half, uh, a short while ago then, so so this all happened originally two, three years ago, and then shoot forward and you're out on holidays, you're with your brother and a friend yep. and you're out fishing and you've made these lifestyle changes, yep. but something else happened. What occurred? It was exactly the same thing. So leading up to, um, to it happening, it was just after Christmas. So I, well, I, I might actually add that, the white blood cell count that was part of the trigger for the electrolyte depletion uh, was caused by a viral infection, and back then it was Ross River virus. This time, it was just before Christmas, I got diagnosed with um, uh, Murray Valley encephalitis, another virus. So it depleted my white blood cell count, which we didn't pick up at the time. Obviously, Christmas, you know, your lifestyle changes lax because it's it's christmas everybody so. everybody lets it go a little bit at christmas don't yeah, they? So, like, ah, bugger. yeah so I, was, <laughs> I spent a couple of weeks up in queensland with the daughters and of course lots of drinking came back and went fishing to the beach and short more drinking too much drinking and uh, the shops for us down at corny point is uh, over 100 kilometers round trip so you tend to only go shopping every week or fortnight if you can and I'd ran out of fruit. Um, I was uh, down to the last few vegetables, so I was very sparingly. I was eating spasmodically. I was skipping breakfast. All the things I've done before, and I know exactly where it leads, uh, and it led to exactly yeah. where it was going to. And, yes, so so that happened out on a boat. We were about 14 kilometres offshore from the boat ramp. Wow. And this is off the coast of South Australia, right? Yeah, down the bottom on the York Peninsula. A lovely yep. part of the planet, actually. Yeah, so we just got onto the fishing grounds. The whiting were prolific. They were going hot. The best day fishing we had in all the time we'd been down there, actually, and it was perfect. And, yeah, of course, I had to just say to the boys, I'm not feeling very well, and they reckon three seconds after that I hit the deck. You didn't fall overboard, did you? No. You stayed in the boat? Yeah, I stayed in the boat. Yeah, my brother caught me. I was heading overboard. Were you wearing a life jacket? No. I have to ask. Were you wearing a life jacket, no. Richard? No. Nope. You weren't wearing a life jacket. No, oh my no, gosh! No, I, we should we should use you as one of those advertisements for what not to do. I'm, I'm an incredibly good swimmer when I'm conscious. So. <laughs> <laughs> That's the point. That's why you wear life jackets yeah, because when you're not conscious, you don't swim. <laughs> yeah, you sink. <laughs> <laughs> so okay, so you, so you you fainted. You you went unconscious. Your heart stopped in the boat. What did your brother do? Uh, my, my brother was panicking because um, this was a quite a severe one. I'd, I'd had a um, uh, some sort of a fit as well during it, some sort of something. 
Like a seizure? Like a seizure, yeah. But he honestly thought that that was me having a heart attack. He, well, he didn't know what to think. So when I come to, this was a lot worse than the first time in Andamuka. It actually absolutely knocked the wind out of my sails. It, you know, I was at the stage where I'd, I didn't know what happened. It was that dramatic. And I'm looking up and there's my brother bawling his eyes yeah. out and my, my, my mate that's operating the boat um, flat out trying to get things ready to head back to shore. Uh, so they laid me down in the cabin. Uh, they just hightailed it back, which was one of the roughest rides ever because they were going way fast. <laughs> 14 kilometres as fast as they could go. Uh, oh, wow. and, and you're lying there try- disoriented, trying to figure out where you are. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, well, I wasn't quite disorientated then because I, I sort of knew where we had to go. And, and I, I reckon that was the quickest 14 kilometres I'd ever done on water. I reckon it only took eight minutes, but it was the fastest his little boat had ever gone, I'm sure. Right. Yeah, so I got picked up by the, um, was it the St. John's Ambulance, the, the volunteer ones down in the in the Yeah, I think regions. it would be. Yeah, so I got picked up by them guys. Yep. Yeah, had, a, had another, had another um, go in the, at the, in the ambulance at checking out, so had another shot at it. Um, and then same thing in in the hospital in Yorktown, all hooked up to all the machines. That was the big one. That was three minutes, two seconds. That was um, that was paddles to bring me back. Wow. Then the same thing. It was just days and days of massive amounts of electrolytes. Same thing. What blood tests come back? Murray Valley encephalitis, critically low white blood cell count. So this, it's obviously that's a trigger to it as well. But, you know, it's a combination of the all. It's not eating properly. It's drinking too much alcohol. It, you know, it's just letting yourself down, basically. You know, and especially after having one warning for this, it's, um, yeah, it made me feel pretty stupid, to tell you the truth. I don't know. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's incredible that you're still here. I mean, you've, that's, that's a lot to go through. Are, do you, are you still feeling? Are you still feeling under the weather, or, or not back up to par, or have you managed to um, get all of those lifestyle points back in again uh, since that time? Uh, yep, even more so this time. Um, us bushmen, you've got to be taught twice before you really take it on board. But the, this one, for me, for me, I'm not as brave as I used to be. I have a lot of intrepidation about going anywhere by myself. And in the past, I was a bit of a loner. I'd, you know, I'd pack the car up and I'd head out. I'd say to the mate, you know, I'm, I'm going to head up north. I'm going gold detecting for a week. To be honest, I'm I'm actually terrified to even contemplate that at the moment. I try not to be anywhere by myself. I am feeling better, wow. but it's... This was a hard one. It's going to be a long journey. It was probably only about eight weeks ago now. Not even that, probably six weeks ago. So it's still quite raw for me. Yeah. But, um, you know, I'm going to do everything I can to get my fitness level back up to make sure I maintain this more regular blood tests, watch the heat. It's, it's, it's all the things they teach you, all the things they teach you in school, all the things that they teach you on the web, you know. The experts that come in and, and you know do their heat stress training and it's 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 in your you know your first aid courses and and why I don't listen to it is is beyond me when you think back what the ramifications can be it's like Jesus I had no idea that it could be you know this deadly. Your story reminds me a little bit of the attitude that a lot of us Aussies have, which is sort of sort of you know she'll be right, she'll be right, mate. It's okay, you know yeah. we can get away with it. Yeah, we can sort of cut away at the edges and and take short shortcuts, and and doesn't really matter if our lifestyle is not quite as ideal as it should be. And and then you need a really big scare to sort of bring you back in check and say, oh, actually, it's not going to be right unless I actually sort two, it out. Two scares, like I said, we don't learn very well up here. <laughs> <laughs> just just need a slight reminder, Richard. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Do you think? Do you think that this um, health scare um, is going to end up making you having to leave Andamooka and go somewhere else that's a little bit more conducive or a little bit more gentle on your system where you're maybe not in such extremes? Or do you think that your drive for Opals and and your love of that location will keep you there regardless? 
Yep, um, uh, never in a million years. There's, there's no way. M- maybe uh, for the summers, I've, um, I've uh, bought a bit of land down at um, on the York Peninsula. So most of the, the, the hottest months are the summers. It's, it's more of a migration. So I'll be, I'll be getting out of the desert. Right. Uh, but basically, uh, no, I can't imagine myself doing anything other than this. Uh, to the fact that I've actually purchased my plot in the graveyard in Andamooka. So I'm serious about staying to the end, yes. Are you going to have a headstone with opals on it, Richard? Uh, <laughs> it, it, it's a, it's a, actually, a, Andamooka would have the most quirky, interesting cemeteries on the planet. You, you, yeah? you have no idea until you come and see it for yourself. But. Oh, describe. I'd like to know. What does what, what the graveyard at Andamooka look like? This is a bit dire subject, but I just, I'm fascinated. Well, that's the thing, see. In Andamooka, it's not a dire subject. Everyone takes the piss out of everyone, even when they're dead. So, you know, we have characters up there. Their names are uh, from Monty Python, Biggest Dickus. You know, the, the fun, <laughs> the the... The memorials showcase all the fun things about the character that's buried beneath that stone, and it, and it's hilarious. Like we might have, I don't know, two hundred people buried up there, but hundred maybe one hundred and eighty people. But the um, a tourist gets there in the morning, and and you know I drive past later on that evening, and he's still there, and he's going, "This is just amazing. I haven't seen anything like it ever." Oh, give me more examples. What sort of stuff would you one see? Of, one of them's got an old 1930 Buick car as a headstone. But, like, it's <laughs> until you see it yourself, Lana, it, it's just, yeah, it's just, it's, it's funny. It's fun. It's, it's good. Yeah. Can you, could you take some photos of the, <laughs> of it for me and send them through and I can put them with the podcast, podcast when I, uh, when I promote it, I can put some photos. That'd be, I mean, a bit strange, quirky, but and and I hear also that up until two hundred two thousand and fifteen, Andamooka was the only Australian township where none of the streets were named. Is that right? Yes, that's that's correct. There was a town was quite divided over these um, new rules. The uh, first it started, and the police were looking for people. They couldn't find anybody because everybody lived on Government Road. Uh, we actually had <laughs> and government roads everywhere. <laughs> yep, they're all, every road was named Government Road. Um, we had uh, seventeen lot one government roads, about thirteen lot twos, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and then it had jumped to lot six, seven, nine, or something. There's no sequence along the road. The lot numbers were seven, forty-one, hundred and twenty-nine, eight. You know, as you're moving up the street. Wow. You know, a lot of the town folk had been fighting this for years, but. Then later in, in life, later on, when they tried to rally us, as again, all the, the, the stalwarts and the steadfasts are all getting old and the ambulances can't find their place. So so they've changed their mind and decided to accept street signs in Andamooka. So it was, it was an interesting project. <laughs> Is there, is there any truth that the song from U2, A Street With No Name, has some relevance or re- some part of Andamooka in it? Um, well, apparently it's not, I've been told, but we actually had U2 perform in the Andamooka Community Hall, um, which was probably about three years before the song, The Streets With No Names, uh, was released. So... We like to think, we're, we're pretty certain that um, Andamooka had an absolute influence on that song, whether it was actually about Andamooka or not. So, yeah, we, we'll, we'll take credit for it. <laughs> You'll take credit regardless. Yeah. Okay, all right. So I want, I want some photos, please, yep. of the cemetery and of the streets with no name. That would be brilliant. Yep. Yep. <laughs> Thank you so Thank you so much for talking to me today, Richard. Um, I'm really glad, in all seriousness, I'm so glad that you have managed to make it through this very scary time. And I know that the most recent turn was just a few months ago. So I'm I'm glad you're here and I'm glad you're recovering and I'm glad you've made your lifestyle changes. And I think that your plan to have a migratory, you know, lifestyle where you spend the summer somewhere a little bit cooler. Yeah. Is probably a very wise idea, um, and I'm sure your children and grandchildren 
would appreciate that too. Yes, yeah, yeah. The grandkids love it down there. It's, it's probably the best part about it is, Papa, take me fishing. Papa, take me fishing. Sure, sure. And it, it keeps me busy enough so I don't even think about drinking with the boys. <laughs> If you had any lessons learned, would you have advice for travellers or people that are working in hot climates? Uh, listen to what they tell you in the in the brochures, in the on the signs. It says, you know, dehydration. It's basically the information's all out there. If you choose to ignore it, like I did, then do so at your peril. But yeah, and if you you know if you're going to be out there in the heat and sun, and you know it's going to be hot, just yeah, lay off the alcohol. Just you know, maybe have a couple with your dinner and stick to a fizzy drink or a glass of milk or a bit of orange juice or something different, something else, because this stuff builds up on you day in, day out. And when it happens, it's, if you're on your own, God forbid, but if I, if I was on my own on any one of those occasions, out in that machine and that excavator or out on the boat the second time, I'd have to be safe to say there's a very good possibility I wouldn't be um, having this conversation with you today, Lana. Well, I'm very glad you're here, Richard, and I'm glad you've made it. (laughs) And I look forward to chatting to you again in several years as you're fishing um, off the coast with your grandchildren. (laughs) Sounds good, Lana. (laughs) Thanks for listening. Word of mouth is always the best promotion for a podcast. So if you enjoy this podcast or a specific story, please share with family and friends. If you haven't already, join our Facebook group called the Flying Doctor Podcast Community. And you can also send feedback, questions or comments to me directly at lana.mitchell at rfds.org.au. Donations to support the Royal Flying Doctor Service can always be made through our website at flyingdoctor.org.au. The Flying Doctor podcast was presented by me, Lana Mitchell, and senior producer is Mandy Coolen. Mm-hmm.